Welcome sixth graders to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. We'd like to give a special welcome to two schools who are with us uh, this afternoon. The first is the Jubilee Wells Branch Leadership Academy. And we also have sixth graders from Rosemont Middle School with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. We wish you could be here in person, um, but since you can't, we're gonna try to, our best to make you feel like you're here through a virtual field trip experience. If you are watching this and have not registered for today's field trip yet, you can still do that. Uh, how you register is by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register. And once you get there, you can register yourself or your class for this trip. Uh, we just use that information for our attendance purposes. Now today's field trip is going to be about measuring and recording changes in motion. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that force and motion are related to potential and kinetic energy. Students will calculate average speed and graph changes in motion. So we're going to start off today by discussing potential and kinetic energy with Mrs. Fuller. Next, we will calculate average speed with Ms. Nash. Third, we will measure and graph changes in motion with Mr. Monroe. And last, we're going to see speed in the wild um, as it pertains to some different animals with Ms. Ramirez. While we're doing, while we're doing all of that, you can ask us questions. Uh, the way you do that during a virtual field trip is not to raise your hand though. Um, instead, you're gonna go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. And there you will fill out a very short form to uh, submit any questions that you have um, for us regarding average speed or motion or anything that we discussed today. You can ask as many questions as you like and we'll do our best to answer all of them in the time that we have with you this morning. So let me stop sharing my screen here and we will get into that discussion of potential and kinetic energy with Mrs. Fuller. Good afternoon, boys and girls. Um, my name is Mrs. Fuller and this is Lauren Chicken. Lauren Chicken laid an egg on my desk this very morning. <clears throat> now, how was she able to do that? Two ways. She had two kinds of energy that she utilized. One was potential energy. That's the energy that is stored in her body because she eats food. And here's a, here's a worm. And the other kind was kinetic energy. She pushed the egg out of her body. So we're going to uh, put her down on the floor, let her eat these worms while we're talking about potential and kinetic energy. Woo, that was fun. All right, well, let's talk about potential energy. For, well, before that, let's talk about what energy is. What is energy? Energy is the ability to do work. And we're gonna talk about the two basic types. Potential, which is the energy of either a position or stored energy, and kinetic. Kinetic's the energy of motion. Now, <clears throat> related to this is the idea of force. Force is the ability to, ability to make things move. Force is a push or a pull. It can make things go, it can make things start moving. It can make things go fast. It can make things go slow. It can cause things to come to a stop. It can also cause things to change direction. Friction is an important force, gravitational force, magnetic force, all those sort of things. So when we talk about force, we're talking about push and pull. And then remember that kinetic energy is the energy of motion. All right, so let's talk first about potential energy. So potential energy is the energy uh, of, of, of it being stored, like the energy stored in your body. So chemical energy stored in the, are, is stored in the bonds of atoms and molecules. And examples of that would be batteries and food, and I could show you the egg too, couldn't I? Because that's food too. Uh, coal, uh, I've got a sack of coal here. It's, it's real dirty, so I've got it wrapped up in something. I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, biomass, that's things like leaves and sticks and kitchen scraps and uh, uh, lawn waste, things like that. The next type is mechanical. And this is energy that's stored in objects by tension. So let me show you my little flying dinosaur here. I'm gonna put him on my finger. And when I pull the tail back, it's like, it's like a rubber band. 
So you see there is tension stored in this particular toy that I haven't let it loose left. So it's just potential right now. When I let it loose, then that's going to be uh, kinetic. Okay, then we've got nuclear. Now we've got nuclear in the core of the sun. Well, most of the energy that we use here on the earth is from the sun, light and heat energy from the sun. But where does it come from? Well, it comes from nuclear energy in the core of the sun and that's called fusion. And in the core of the sun, uh, hydrogen atoms are fused together to form helium atoms. Now here on the earth, we have something called fission. And what that is, is we split an atom as opposed to putting two atoms together to form one, we take one and split it apart. And the, the type of things that we split apart are like plutonium and things like that. So <clears throat> hydrogen, um, okay. So fission has a lot of problems uh, as, as far as waste is concerned because it stays radioactive for thousands and thousands of years. So we, we do have nuclear power plants that use that potential energy uh, in the uh, plutonium uh, in order to, to make energy through fission. And then finally, we've got gravitational, which uh, an example of that would be a, a dam with uh, uh, hydropower. So the, the water has the potential for uh, generating a lot of electricity, but it's held in abeyance. It's held behind a dam until it's time for it to flow over. So we know the power is there, but until it starts moving, it's considered a potential. Now let's look at kinetic. Now, kinetic energy, and we've got lots of different kinds of kinetic energy, radiant energy, and that's energy on the electromagnetic scale. Now, when you get into astronomy in the eighth grade, you'll be learning about uh, the electromagnetic spectrum starts with radio waves, which are really big. And then it goes all the way down to gamma rays, which are about the size of an atom. So they, they range widely in size. The, the one you probably have the most experience with is visible light. That's radiant energy. So radiant energy is considered kinetic because it's, it's in movement. The next one, thermal energy, heat energy. Now we have uh, geothermal energy here on our earth caused by the, the heating of water, by uh, its uh, proximity to the mantle of the earth. It, you know, the deeper you go, the hotter it gets, the water can get real hot and then spew out. And they, we can make electricity from this really hot water. For example, in Iceland, the people don't even have to pay a, a light bill because everything is free because they have so much geothermal energy from the volcanoes that they live next to. And then we've got the energy of motion. Energy of motion is stored in the movement of objects. Now we've got this little acronym, PKM, stands, uh, you can remember it by please kick me. And I'm gonna go back to my flying dinosaur. Re uh, the P stands for potential, the K stands for kinetic, and the M stands for mechanical. So right now I'm demonstrating potential energy and the tension. And when I let go, it's gonna go flying across the room. And that's the energy of motion. And so those two together, potential and kinetic equal mechanical energy. And then we've got sound energy and that's the movement of energy through substances in longitudinal waves. Now, that, what that means is, it's a long way of saying is that sound has to go through something. It, it's not gonna, um, it won't go through a vacuum like in space. So it has to go through air, it can go through water. Actually, I think it does better in water than it does in air, uh, metal, all kinds of things. It'll go through a lot of things. And I'm gonna demonstrate some sound energy uh, for you right now with two forces, a push and a pull. The push is gonna be when I exhale, the pull is gonna be when I inhale. So I'm gonna exhale and you heard the sound energy that was generated by the push of the wind coming out of my lungs. For the pull, 
I inhaled and pulled air into my body. So that was a push and a pull, those two forces. All right, now let's look at the next one. Electrical energy, and that's delivered by tiny charged particles called electrons, which are very familiar with. And they typically involve moving through a wire. One example of electrical energy that is very prevalent on our planet is lightning. And lightning is so tremendously powerful, it doesn't go through a wire. It just goes straight from the clouds to the earth or from the earth to the clouds or from cloud to cloud. But it's a tremendous amount of energy. So both potential and kinetic, uh, stored energy and the energy of motion are extremely important. Uh, if you have any questions, ask Mr. Broughton. Thanks, have a great afternoon. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. The question that came in um, was, if sound has to move through something, how do astronauts talk to each other in space? And how that works is they have a device inside their helmet, um, which will transfer sound waves um, to radio waves and then transmit those radio waves um, to the ground here on Earth or to another astronaut in space or the International Space Station. And those radio waves um, are not sound waves, so they can move through space. And uh, that's how they, they can talk to each other. All right, now we are going to uh, move into um, a calculating average speed with Ms. Nash. Hello, welcome to my classroom. So today we're going to be talking about speed. And the, the formula is quite easy, actually. So speed is just distance divided by time. So you can add up different distances and different times, two different distances, two different times, and you get your average. If I divide it. Distance, you can calculate the distance if you know speed times time. And if you know distance and speed, you can find time. So they're all related. So I decided to use some of my little friends in the classroom to see if I could make some calculations of average time. So I have a friend here. It's a, a Madagascar Houston cockroach. Okay. And not the carpet to my kitchen. They would, I think, beat this one in the, the race, but let's see. So first I tried to put them through a one meter long tube. But the problem was he just stopped in the middle and I had to shake it to get them out. So I have this little ramp here. And we'll see. So you can see the problem we have. So we start up here and nothing. So I give them a little poke to encourage them to move along. No, that way. That way, keep going. This actually worked better. The kind of little vibration behind him. There he goes. There he goes. There he goes. Are you timing this? There he goes. Okay, the, the finish line's coming up. Here's lunch approaching, and he made it. Yay! I'm going to put him back in his little tube here and put him back in his head. So, so I did that a few times, and here were my results. So, you could have done it as many times. I did it three times. So, one meter, first time he did it in 30 seconds. So his speed was one meter per second. Next time, one meter, took him a whole 60 seconds. Okay, so uh, one meter per 0.5. This one's one, point, one meter per one minute. Then the next time he was really slow, one meter took him 90 seconds, a minute and a half. So one meter per 1.5. So the average comes out to be one meter per minute. Yeah. Here's my argument for using the metric system to do your calculations. So the question is then, if he goes one meter in one minute, just to make things easy, how long will it take the cockroach to walk one kilometer? So if we were using miles and we had one yard, then we'd have to turn like that, the number of yards into feet, okay, and then divided into miles. 
which is really complicated. But one kilometer is how many meters? A thousand. So there we go, a thousand minutes. And then you just have to divide a thousand minutes by 60 to get um, 16 hours and 40 minutes. So the metric system makes life a lot easier. Now, the next one I tried to do some calculations was my turtle. So turtles are notoriously slow, and it turns out they're rather stubborn. So I had to put in little boundaries here. And there he goes. You see? No, it's not my cabinet. The problem is if you try to encourage them, you just get scared and you just hide in yourself. So that didn't work at all. No. Okay, so we'll try again. One more animal. I have one more animal we're gonna try out here. Got my one meter ramp, and I'm gonna bring out everyone's favorite animal. Our friend Red. So Red, it turns out, is about the red the corn snake here, and Red is about one meter long. So it's a beautiful animal, no legs, but he can move pretty fast. So I figure if I put his head at one end of the ramp, and let's see how long it takes him to get up to the top. And you'll see some of the problems we ran into with this little friend. So here we go. Let's see if we'll do it this time. Okay, there we go. Come on, Red, you can do it. Come on, Red, come on, come on, there we go, there we go. 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 He's going. He's going. He's going. Come on, Red. Come on. Okay, he's doing better this time. And he stopped. So this is a problem with reptiles. Okay. I had a dog. I could call him and he'd come. Okay. But reptiles are not very convenient. They pretty much doesn't care unless there's a mouse on the other end. So we're going to see a few little um, pictures I have of other fast animals real quick. And let's see if we can show them really fast. And there we go, speedy animals. And make that go away. There we go. So everyone agrees that the cheetah is the fastest land that there's a little disagree about how fast they're actually going. Some people say 70, 60 seems a little bit more reasonable. Oh, why is it not working? Hmm, well, there we go. So they can turn really fast, okay. They're, they've got that long tail, kind of helps them make that turn. The second fastest one, there we go. It's really a surprise. The pronghorn antelope that lives in West Texas, even. And why are they the fastest, second fastest animal? Okay. There are no cheetahs out there in West Texas. They can easily outrun a wolf or a coyote, anybody that's out there. They're really, really fast. Here's what the, the cheetahs are eating a, a um, springbok. They can run about 55 miles an hour, just like the pronghorn. Here they go, they can jump. Here's a black buck, another one, fast one. Here's a wildebeest, 50 miles an hour, big, big. Who's eat, cheetahs can't eat wildebeest, they're too big. This is who's eating that wildebeest. Also, surprisingly fast, 50 miles an hour, a lion. Why do I have to run so fast? I gotta feed all those babies. So the reason that the um, 
go back to the our friend the, the pronghorn. The reason they're so fast is there used to be cheetahs in North America. They're extinct now, but the pronghorn had to outrun the cheetah, and they're still really, really fast. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now, and if you have any questions, you can ask Mr. Broughton. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nash. Um, the question that came in is, what is a light year? Um, it does have to do with um, speed and distance, but it, it's, uh, you'd think a year would be time, um, but it's not, it's, it's a light year is how far light can travel in one year. So uh, light travels at about 300 million meters per second after it goes, uh, uh, that whatever distance that it goes in, or that um, distance in one year, that is a light year, so it's a distance. Another way to think about a light year is it's almost uh, six trillion miles. Let me double check, check that, but yes, it's almost six trillion miles in space. But uh, if you get into trillions, those numbers are, uh, harder to deal with because they're bigger. So you can just say one light year. All right, now we're going to look at uh, measuring and graphing changes in motion with Mr. Monroe. Okay, hey, good afternoon students. My name is Mr. Monroe and we're going to look into graphing motion. Now, you know, describing the journey being made by an object, if you were to try to do that in words, Sometimes that could be rather difficult. And uh, I guess in a way after working with graphs, I would consider that kind of boring, okay? Now, when we talk about motion, we're talking about the change in position measured by distance and time normally. Speed tells us at the rate of which the object is moving and velocity tells us the speed and direction of the moving object. Acceleration tells us that the rate of speed or direction has changes involved in it. So in developing a graph, there are certain protocols that is used. For example, uh, if we were to set up a graph, we definitely would have to have axis for that graph. Um, the y-axis, which would be the vertical part of the graph, probably would be used for distance. Of course, the horizontal part of the graph, the x-axis, it would be used for time, okay? Now, I'm just going to show you several items that I have kind of put together to, to show how you would put certain data on a graph and then I have prepared two graphs at the very end that I wanna show, show you how I did that. And these particular graphs that I did, they were of high level of interest to me because many, many years ago, I used to be a runner. And so the graphs that I'm gonna show you at the very end deal with running. Now, when you chart an object moving at a constant speed, there is a starting point on the y-axis, which is actually, and, and the x-axis in the very corner. This line shows the motion of the object. Because it's pretty well uniform, that means this is a steady or constant motion. It's um, moving at a distance and is pretty consistent, consistent with the time at the very bottom. If you uh, chart something that is at rest, you can see that there was an incline here or that one, but something at rest, it's not going to be covering any distance. So the line is going to be straight and it's going to be there for the entire time. So actually that's saying that the object is at rest. On the other hand, sometimes an object can start out and be pretty constant. Then all of a sudden it will accelerate. Now the steeper the line, 
the faster that it's starting to move. And I'll show you that as we get a little further in. Here, I have charted two different objects starting at the same point. Now we can see one line, the red line is steeper, steeper than the other one. So this one is moving a lot faster to get to the same distance, which would be right along this line here. This one is moving a little slower. And you will see that as we get into the graph that I have created. Also showing that there is an acceleration. This is a gradual acceleration. As you can see, starting point here, time is down here, distance is here. You can see that it begins to curve up. The line gets steeper and steeper. But there's no sudden acceleration to make it all of a sudden jump to a steep incline. So this is showing acceleration, but it was a gradual acceleration. Now, I know that there's a certain time of the year when uh, high school athletes, even college athletes, they want to prove themselves to be super athletes so that they can reach that ultimate goal or maybe be becoming a professional athlete, maybe playing professional football. Uh, I believe they call that period of uh, coming together, a Columbine, where professional scouts or even college scouts are there to see what kind of skill set different athletes have. And one of those skill sets is how fast you can run in a 40 yard dash. That's the way it used to be long ago. Well, I have created a graph right here that shows on the bottom line, the bottom axis, which is the X axis, that is the axis that we're using for time and it's marked off in seconds, one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, six seconds, seven seconds. And then along the uh, Y axis, the distance is marked off in yards, 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, 50 yards. There is a starting point. At the sound of the gun or however they start that 40 yard dash, that's when it starts. And as you can see, this particular runner, what he did, he ran the 40 yard dash in around, around five seconds. This is the time right here, it kind of, intersects right here, maybe a little bit above it. But once he got to the 40 yard dash and knew that the race was over, what happened? He became at rest because there's the straight line right there. It shows that he was at rest. He did run the 40 yard dash in five seconds. And you know, a lot of times athletes would do a little better if there's some competition right beside them. So I've created another uh, graph right here that shows that there were two runners, a runner one, runner two, they had the same starting point. The graph is set up, time at the bottom at the X axis, one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, six seconds, seven seconds. And then the number of yards as far as distance, 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, 50 yards, and we can see that runner number one, he ran the 40 yard dash in five seconds. That wasn't me back then, okay? I was a little faster than that, but he ran it in five seconds. All right, runner number two, that's the red line here. Same starting point. He finished up, you can see his line is a little steeper. He finished up and ran his time. It ended right here. He ran his time in 4.0 seconds. So it's a 40 yard dash. He was a lot fast, a little faster. That's about like I was back in the day. No, I'm just kidding guys. But anyhow, he did very well. And looking at that time and the distance that he ran that time in, he would probably be, uh, that, that's one skill set that probably would be accepted because he was a little bit faster 
than runner number one. Now, those graphs deal with time and distance. There's also ways that you can show that there's a deceleration, meaning a slowing down, and that would be a line that would eventually curve down, okay? There's also uh, motion graphs. Instead of using distance, they use time, I mean, uh, speed. The y-axis would be the speed. The bottom axis, which is the x-axis, would still also be time. But you have to remember, your lines are going to mean something different. In this, in this particular condition, if we were doing speed for the y-axis and time is the x-axis, that slanting line, rather than it showing a constant speed, it would show an acceleration, OK? It would show an acceleration because he's getting faster. Also, a straight line in this sense would mean that the speed is constant instead of being at rest. Well, hopefully I've given you a little bit of information about how to graph motion of objects on a graph. Very interesting way. I had fun doing it and I'm working on one that would actually show uh, acceleration for a long jumper or broad jumper is what we would call it. So it takes a little more detail to do that, but I'm hoping to get that done because I've got a granddaughter that loves to do the long jump and maybe that can help her out. Now, if there, you have any questions, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mr. Bott and maybe he can answer those questions for you. I want you guys to have a good rest of the virtual field trip while you're with us and y'all have a good day. All right, Mr. Broughton. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. I'm gonna share my screen here to um, do a quick recap of what you already showed us. So if you were looking at a graph that has a distance and time, if you see a straight line that's moving forward with a constant speed, it's not slowing up or slowing down or speeding up. If it's a flat line, that means the object is at rest. It's not moving any direction. If you see the curved line, it's gradually increasing speed. Or if it's this kind of curve, then it's gradually decreasing um, its speed. Uh, and I brought this up because the question that came in was, how do you know what intervals to count by when you put the numbers on the y-axis? And um, you, you, it's just, uh, I guess, a judgment call that you're going to have to make when you're graphing. But I kind of like to put 10 marks on the y-axis, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but usually around 10. So if the distance is 10 meters, I'll just count by ones up to 10. But if the distance is 100 meters, well, then I'm going to count by tens and do like 20, 30, 40, 50 to keep my 10 marks. If it's 1,000 meters, I'll count by 100. Um, it just depends on the, the distance that you're um, covering in your graph. So different graphs count by different numbers just because of the data that they are representing. All right, now we're going to uh, move into our last teacher, Mr. Mears, and she's going to show us the speed of some different animals. So hello, my name is Mr. Maris, and we're going to be looking at the average speed of some different animals. Uh, so as Ms. Nash mentioned, the average speed is just the total distance traveled divided by the total time it took to travel that distance. Um, and as she mentioned, scientists and pretty much most of the rest of the world uses the metric system. So when it comes to the metric system and speed, we can say it in terms of meters per second if it's a short distance or kilometers per hour if it's a longer distance, or if it's a super short distance, we can use centimeters or millimeters. Now the US uses the customary system and that's miles per hour or feet per hour. And if it's a small distance, we can use inches per second as well. But again, scientists use the metric system. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen with you guys and we're gonna look at a couple of videos of some animals and their average speed. I'm going to try it full screen and see if the videos play. If not, we'll go back to the little screen. Um, so this first video is of some cows running. So cows have an average speed of about 15 miles per hour. And this video is taken in slow motion so that you can see them. And just for your reference, uh, one mile is about 1.6 kilometers. So in order to convert 
miles per hour to kilometers, you simply take the number of miles you have and multiply it by 1.6. So if the cow runs 15 miles per hour, you would take 15 miles, multiply that times 1.6, and that tells us that 15 miles per hour is simply 24 kilometers about. There's a decimal point in there, but I just rounded. And then on the right, we have a picture of Sarah and Oreo. Um, those are our heifers and a heifer is just a female uh, that hasn't given birth yet to other calves. So I know typically speaking, everyone just calls them all cows, but there's a difference. Uh, so a cow is technically a female that has had at least one calf. And I believe Sarah and Oreo are still young and they haven't had any calves yet. Um, so our next animal we're gonna be looking at are goats. Uh, the goat's average speed is about 10 to 14 miles per hour. So just a little bit uh, less than the cow. Um, and again, one mile is 1.6 kilometers. So if you were to convert the average speed for our goats, what would that be in uh, kilometers per hour? So I'll show you guys the video of these cute running goats. I'm gonna play the audio just because they sound really cute. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have this kind of goat here at the environmental center, but I sure wish we did because they are really cute. Maybe one day I'll get a goat of my own. The goat that you see on the right is Jabez and he's our boar goat and a boar goat is a meat goat and he's eating, I think those are some red bud leaves. And then the next picture or video is of chickens and chickens have an average speed of about nine miles per hour. So these are the slowest so far of the animals that we've looked at. Um, and again, uh, they run because there's lots of predators out here that would love to eat them. So we actually have hawks and coyotes and bobcats out here that have preyed upon some of our chickens. Uh, so here's a video of some chickens that we have out here at the environmental center. This is taken out near our parking lot. Um, so you can see we have quite a few chickens and then you'll see a turkey here in a, just a second. That would be Mr. Gobbles. Um, so yeah, they actually run pretty fast. Um, in the evenings, they get put up in their chicken coop and they will run super fast away from Mr. Rotten because they don't want to be put up. And that little guy there is a little weird chicken named Flash and he is super fast. So you can see I'm kind of jogging after him and he's darting away. Uh, so he can actually dart pretty fast if you look at those long legs they have. And that just helps so that they can run away from predators. And then in our next one, it's just a little infographic so you can compare some more uh, average speeds. So on the left, we have a picture of Usain Bolt and he actually holds the Olympic records. Uh, so he did a sprint at 27.8 miles per hour. So that's quite fast. The average fit person uh, has a speed of about eight to 10 miles per hour. And then you can see a T-Rex uh, runs at about 25 miles per hour. So technically, uh, if he were sprinting, uh, Usain Bolt could probably outrun a T-Rex. And then this next video is a Pepper, my chicken. Um, I recorded her and I timed her going down my classroom. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at her. As you're watching the video, be thinking about how can you describe Pepper's change in position? So what could you use as a reference point to let us know that she is in motion? And think about, are there points where she got faster, where she accelerated? Are there points where she slowed down? And then are there any points where she just stopped and wasn't moving at all? And just for reference, uh, each tile on my floor is about one foot. Uh, so I know she went 16 feet and she was walking or jogging in uh, the southern direction. So I'm going to play the video for you guys. This is not as fast as she can go. She can get pretty fast, but she's not, she's not doing her full speed in this video. And she, at the end, she's getting her mealworms as her treat for her reward for coming all the way when she's called. So, and our next question is, if Pepper ran 16 feet in 15 seconds, how can you calculate Pepper's average speed in meters per second? So think about the steps that you can take. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through it because I have a challenge question that you're gonna do next. Um, so this will help you for that challenge question. And I also have a uh, conversion for you. So one foot is equal to about 0.3048 meters. 
So again, we're gonna try and calculate her average speed in meters per second. So the first thing you need to do, um, you have to convert the feet to meters. So using that conversion, I'm gonna take the 16 feet and I'm gonna multiply it by 0 0.3048 meters. And that gives me about 4.88 meters. So she ran about 4.88 meters in 15 seconds. But I have another step to answer that question. So now we need to figure out how many meters she ran per second. So to find that out, all I have to do is take that 4.88 meters and divide it by the 15 seconds. And that gives me my answer of 0.32 meters per second. So that lets us know that Pepper ran 0.32 meters per second. My next question is how long will it take her to run 15 meters? And that's about the approximate length of my classroom. So I'll just give you a quick second to just ponder how you could solve that problem. And the way I solved it, you just take the 15 meters and you divide that by her average speed. So 15 meters divided by 0.32 meters per second. And that gives you 46.875 seconds. So it actually wouldn't take her that long if she kept up her average speed. And then sort of what Ms. Nash went over already um, is just a quick review of how you can find um, certain aspects if you have like, if you have, uh, if you're trying to find distance and you know the speed and time, then all you have to do is distance is equal to speed times the time. <laughs> And then if you are trying to find the time, then all you do is take your distance and divide it by the speed. And if you're trying to find speed, all you do is take your distance and divide it by time. So a quick way to remember that is to draw yourself a little triangle. And the way some people remember it is you have your triangle that you draw on your paper, and then you remember it by the saying, the slow turtle. I know it's like slang, but if it helps you remember, it helps you remember. Uh, so does stands for distance. Slow stands for speed and T stands for turtle. So if you make your triangle and you put your letters in that order, um, then that will help you solve for your missing factor. And then my challenge question for you guys, I walked 2.8 miles in 45 minutes. So what is my average speed in kilometers per hour? And just for your conversions, one mile is equal to 1.6 kilometers. And 60 minutes, of course, is in one hour. And I used a free app. It's called Map My Walk. And it's just a free app you put on your cell phone. It uses your cell phone's GPS and it tracks um, your mileage and where you go and it gives you a cool little map. Uh, so this is a map of our trails, one of our trails that we have out here. Uh, so quickly just jot down uh, the information or take a photo with your phone. Um, and then that will be a challenge question for you guys to try and figure out. And just to show you my walking trail, I have a quick little video just to show you so you can experience the environmental center even though you aren't able to join us. Lovely windy day. So think about how can we measure wind speed? What tool would that be? I walk really loud, so you can probably hear the crunchy leaves I'm stepping on. Those are Osage orange or horse apples. You can see a lot of our trees have lost their leaves. And what do you think used to be in that empty spot right there? And then I stumbled across this cool snake. You can describe the motion of the snake. He actually went pretty fast after I startled him. I think it's some sort of little grass snake or something like that. But he was super cute. I was excited to find him. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop it there. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And then the last thing I just wanna show you since y'all saw Pepper in the videos, this is Pepper, she's the blue silky chicken. Again, she has those long legs to help her run and she gets her name blue silky because she actually has blue ear skin on her ears and then silky because she's super soft when you try and pet her. Um, so that's all I have for you guys today for average speed of animals. 
uh, we're going to go ahead and pass it back to Mr. Broughton and he'll answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Um, two questions came in. One is why don't we use the metric system? And uh, in the United States, we don't use, well, we use both systems, but we use the customary system uh, mostly. And uh, we would not switch from the customary system because it would take a long time and cost a lot of money to try to switch to the metric system. And the other question is, uh, how do I catch those chickens um, if they're faster than me? And uh, I don't really have to catch them. They don't like being chased. So they get tired of me chasing them and just go into their coop at the end. Uh, Cause if, if I had to catch each chicken, uh, that would be very difficult. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here real quick. And we're going to do a quick recap of what we did today. So today we measured and recorded changes in motion. During this virtual field trip, students discovered that force and motion are related to potential and kinetic energy. Students calculated average speed and graphed changes in motion. So we started off by exploring potential and kinetic energy with Mrs. Fuller. Then we calculated average speed with Ms. Nash. Third, we measured and graphed changes in motion with Mr. Monroe. And we just saw the speed of some different animals with Ms. Ramirez. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate you taking the time to learn about um, speed and distance and time and average speed with us. Um, we would like to know what you think about today's field trip. You can let us know by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback and um, leaving us some feedback. We use your responses to improve what we do here. We hope to see you again in about three weeks for the next field trip for sixth grade. It's going to be about inclined planes and uh, have a great rest of your day.